this meeting actually grew out of a conversation that began when the North Carolina Legislative Black Caucus expressed a desire to have a statewide discussion about policy approaches uh, regarding best practices in law enforcement and training. Um, obviously, it's in everyone's interest to prevent tragedies like those we've seen around the country, and, and it just seems like every day there's something in the news again um, uh, that, that we hope we can prevent from happening in the state of North Carolina. Seeing all of you here today, we know that local law enforcement agencies across the state are open to and welcome discussion about how to strengthen trust between law enforcement and the community that they serve. So it is important to have this type of dialogue, but also to see if we can arrive at some tangible proposals that we might take back to, our, to the legislature, to our districts, and to those whom are sworn to serve. Regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our political affiliation, our religion or national origin, we are in this together. That is a theme that we have tried to emphasize. Uh, we are all in this together. I'd like to begin by um, introducing our panel members this morning, and uh, I'll begin with uh, Chief Jeannie Miller. Thank you for joining us this morning. Chief Miller has served as Chief of Police with two agencies for over 21 years. She has been Chief at the Davidson Police Department since November of 2005, and previously spent 11 years as Chief of Police with the Reynoldsburg, Ohio Police Department. Before that, she worked as Assistant Chief of Operations for Peoria, Illinois Police Department. She was a member of the Detroit Police Department from 1973 to 1991. Rising through the ranks... <laughs> I probably should have kept that hidden. <laughs> Rising through the ranks that, to lieutenant, with assignments in youth section, gang squad, gang squad, narcotics, internal affairs, and major crimes division. Since her arrival in Davidson, the Davidson Police Department has committed to a community-oriented and problem-solving style of policing. Officers are assigned to specific schools, neighborhoods, and business districts, and they are required to conduct at least two hours of foot patrol per shift. In July of 2008, the Davidson Police Department joined an elite group of small agencies and achieved the recognition status with Kalia, or C A L E A. In two, Kalia, I'm sorry. In 2011, the Davidson Police Department became fully accredited. Chief Miller believes that an accredited agency ensures citizens' professional service and full accountability. Please help in, wel in welcoming Chief Miller with us today. Next, we have Hope County Sheriff Hubert A. Peterkin. He is the chairman of the North Carolina Sheriff's Association Officers and Executive Committee. A lifelong resident of Hope County, he has served in law enforcement for over 29 years. He was a law enforcement officer with the Fayetteville Police Department, holding various positions for a total of 16 years and in 1998 was appointed as the Chief of Deputies at the Hope County Sheriff's Office. He was first elected Sheriff in 2002. He is now serving his fourth term. He was first elected as Sheriff of Hope County in 2002, second term in 2006, third term in 2010, and ran unopposed in his fourth term in 2014. In 2015, Sheriff Peterkin has served as president for the North Carolina Sheriff's Association. Under Sheriff Peter, Peterkin's leadership, the Hope County Sheriff's Office has built a new detention center and adopted a number of programs to enhance public safety. 
Most recently, the department began a citizens academy designed to improve relations with the public and provide citizens with a better understanding of the agency's responsibility. Please help me in welcoming Sheriff Peterkin this morning. Next, we have Chief Brandon Zudema, who was appointed the Chief of Police in Garner in December of 2009, following a 15-year career with the Lynchburg, Virginia Police Department. Chief Zudema is an active member of the North Carolina Association of Chiefs of Police and currently serves as the second vice president. He is also an active member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police and represents North Carolina on the IACP, State Association of Chiefs of Police. Chief Zudema is the co-founder and executive director of the Garner Police Athletics Activities League and serves on the Wake County Youth Thrive Board of Directors. And he is also the chair of the Wake Emergency Communications Organization. Thank you, Chief, for being here this morning. Chief Zudema. Also with us today, we have John Gregory. John Gregory has been in law enforcement since 1990. He currently serves as the director of the Basic Law Enforcement Academy at Wake Tech Community College. Prior to becoming the director of the BLET program, Mr. Gregory served as a law enforcement training coordinator at Wake Tech. He also has been an instructor at the North Carolina Justice Academy. Over the years, he has developed and delivered training in the areas of basic law enforcement training, officer survival training, subject control arrest techniques, fitness, close quarter control, and cyber crimes. Mr. Gregory has served as a full-time law enforcement officer for 11 years, both at the local level and the state level. He is a reserve deputy. His career includes working with local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. His career includes um, being a member of the FBI North Carolina High Tech Computer Crimes Federal Task Force. He's also a sworn special deputy with the U.S. Marshal Service. He also has instructed the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center he has received training from the FBI National Academy, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, and the National White Collar Crime Center. Please help me in welcoming him this morning. Again, it's an honor to be with you this morning, the active, your moderator. As I told someone this morning, I know you were expecting Megan Kelly, but this is the best I have. So. Hope you bear with me this morning as I post questions and, and have some great dialogue. Before we begin, I think it may be useful to briefly describe the current law enforcement training structure in North Carolina. As I understand it, the Criminal Justice Education Training and Standards Commission and the, and the Sheriff's Education Training and Standards Commission sets the minimum training topics and standards for prospective law enforcement officers known as the Basic Law Enforcement Training, or BLET. The commissions regularly review the curriculum to make updates. Most of that actual BLET training takes place at our community colleges. From there, most local, most local law enforcement agencies require an additional period of field training. The state commission commissions also established in-service mandatory training for existing law enforcement professionals. We have two North Carolina Justice Academy campuses where many of the courses are designed as train the trainer instruction so that designated officers can take this advanced training back to their agencies. I hope I've uh, described this correctly. Great. If I've made any, any mistakes, please let me know. Um, what I've let out this morning is, is leading me into um, the first question. What do each of you see as strengths and weaknesses of that current structure as I've described it? And first, I'll begin with Chief Miller. Chief? I think that the uh, current structure is very important. 
that one of the weaknesses of the current system is that it's not nimble. It takes a long time to change or to modify uh, the basic uh, academy curriculum. Um, and I'll give you a, right now as a perfect example. One of the big issues that's being talked about um, at the IACP level and the Police Executive Research Forum level is de-escalation. The de-escalation of the hint of situations and teaching officers um, verbal tactics. When I was in Ohio and on the Ohio Chiefs Association, I argued for years that we needed to institute some sort of verbal tactical communication training at our basic, our most basic level. Um, today, de-escalation and verbal um, tactical and verbal tactical <coughs> communication is something that is critical uh, to the way we do our jobs. And yet, it's not something that will be easily implemented um, at the basic law enforcement training level. So I would say that the strength of basic law enforcement training is uniformity uh, to a degree. I'm sorry. And the, the weakness would be that it's not nimble. It does not respond quickly or easily. I would say that the strength, one of the strengths is, is the wide variety of training that they offer. They offer a lot of training over there to cover just about every type of category or situation that's needed in our law enforcement agencies. One weakness I would say, and I don't mean it directly, as we look at the problems that we're facing right now, uh, I would like to see a more, a bigger transition that goes towards the problems that we're facing. Put the training, put the training in, in perspective that deals with the problem that we have right now. You know, it's not a situation that we're dealing with. I think uh, Representative Haynes said it very well. We don't want North Carolina to fall into the categories of our other states. So when we got a powerful resource like our academies and all this training, I think we, we have exactly what it takes to be proactive. So what am I saying? Look at the training that's needed to ensure that our law enforcement is doing exactly what they need to take care of the community, make all the right decisions, make sure that everything's in perspective as they deal with the community and not have the fear or this courage to be able to do their job. So I would say the weakness is just making sure we transition those trainings to deal with the problems that are at hand. Good morning. Uh, I would agree with uh, both of the uh, other panelists. I'd like to take a quick second and uh, from a, a Wake County standpoint, thank Wake Technical Community College for their VLT program. There are similar programs at other community colleges that are a tremendous asset to law enforcement and thus for the communities. I want to particularly mention Mark Strickland who's here from the Justice Academy. Um, they run two different uh, locations in the state. Incredible partner for law enforcement, very responsive, very collaborative. So appreciate that, Mark, and that takes us a long ways. Uh, in terms of the strengths, I would agree with uh, Chief Miller that the ability to have consistent training and a, a group or, or a couple of groups that are focused on what that training is and trying to be in communication with not just themselves, but with practicing, practicing excuse me, professionals, but also academics and others, and paying attention to what's going on, not only in North Carolina, but outside of North Carolina. Um, so that consistency is good. Um, I would also agree that the challenge is not only how do we get what's current and what needs to be into these academies, but at some point, what do we give up, if anything? Um, because we're at, what, 600 and 616 hours at Wake Pack Daily T. Um, we know we're talking about wanting fair and, and uh, impartial policing. We're wanting implicit bias training. We're wanting uh, other things added into it. Um, but either what you give up or at what point can we find a balance there? Um, and that also goes into the in-service training uh, because we continue to ask more and more of, of police officers, sheriff's deputies, law enforcement officers, um, some of which they're very prepared for, but some of which they're not at all prepared for. Um, and that particularly, I would speak to mental health, um, is a growing concern in the law enforcement community and in all of our communities um, in terms of how do we deal with these folks. Uh, some of the statistics 
are, are staggering and breathtaking in terms of the number of people that we're dealing with that have mental health issues that are contributing to their behavior, particularly in some of the encounters that have been mentioned by the representatives here today, and how do we better prepare to deal with those? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, where North Carolina stands with training, uh, I hear comments made about our training program and the way our commission has set forth for the basic program and our law enforcement and service program. It's one of the best in the state. Uh, I hear individuals that come from out of state and our state at the community college level and say, I didn't realize you guys did that. I didn't know your program was set up that way. Uh, so I want to commend the, the academy and the commission for putting together a very good program that we have champion at, uh, at, the, at college. Um, that being a real good strength for our program uh, across the nation, uh, being nationally recognized. The other thing, uh, as far as a weakness, I don't really see it as a weakness, but I see it as a strength at the same time. The Academy and the Commission has recognized that scenario-based training is the direction we need to go. However, with those 616 hours that we have to put this curriculum in place, Again, where do we find the balance? Where do we add? Where do we take away? When you actually put an individual into a training environment, you will actually see the way they will react. The more we're able to put a student into a situation, we as an instructor or an evaluator can determine whether or not what type of remediation training needs to take place, or if that particular individual has that particular exercise. Uh, so that's what I would recommend moving forward on the training side is more time for scenario-based training. Again, these are exercises that would take additional time. It's a, not a class that you can go and sit for four hours. You have to go through the class, then you have to set aside the time to actually conduct the training, do the evaluation, remediate, and then continue on. Thank you very much. As a couple follow-up questions. Um, do you believe that the 1,660 hours is an adequate amount of hours, and also the mental health piece, do you believe that there's substantial training for that. Right now we're at 616 hours. I would like to see more. Our college allows me to do 744 hours, which I wish I could do more than 744. Uh, that's based on the community college system. However, other community colleges across the state cannot run the 744 hours due to constraints within the curriculum system. Uh, we run our program and continue with it. Other academy programs across the state far exceed 616 hours, but that's outside of the state's basic curriculum. Again, we are restricted to the 616 hours on the basic curriculum. Students need more. To give you a comparison, an individual going through barber school does over 1,000 hours of training to cut hair, but law enforcement only can do 616 hours. That's just a comparison. So, in terms of the mental health issues, we have a, a very effective uh, crisis intervention training or CIT program that's prevalent throughout most, if not all, of the state. Uh, Wake County has been involved with that, I think, for the better part of a decade. Um, we are continuing to work to train our officers in that regard. Um, the challenge comes is that it really starts to stretch the context of law enforcement and even public safety to some extent. Um, because that it really goes outside of the, the knowledge base and I would say the area of expertise of police officers. Um, we're not trained for that particularly, but as with many things in society, when they're not sure who to call for that, the call goes to 911 and we end up being the people that respond. So I know there's conversation about wanting to add that uh, the basic of that is a 40 hour curriculum. Uh, there's discussion of adding that to the basic PLET program. Uh, many of us are working on adding that um, for all of our staff, not just selected people. Uh, you see that as one of the recommendations in the President's 21st Century Task Force on policing report. Um, a lot of what I'm sure we're going to talk about today comes out of that. Um, but we also have to, I think, acknowledge that respectfully, the mental health system in North Carolina is broken. Um, and I would tell you, I think I can speak briefly for the sheriff who tell you runs the largest mental health facility around, and that's called the jail. Um, and it's not an effective way. It's not effective in terms of providing the services that these individuals need. And it's not effective in terms of the, re the limited resources that the sheriff has for what we ask him to do in, uh, in this county and I'm sure in others. So it's an ongoing challenge. Thank you. I just want to say there's always more room for more training. 
and I would say all the training that we're getting is absolutely needed. But as Chief said, and I did not mess up your last name, I'm going to say Chief Brandon, just for the record for that. Uh, Chief, he made some, what did we give up? You know, we, we're looking at the problems that we're facing right now. We're trying to be proactive. So what do we give up or add to make sure that we're being proactive, to make sure that we're ready to deal with it? Once it it's not going to be an if it happens in North Carolina. It's when. It will happen. So the trainings that we have, we don't want to give up anything. If anything, add some training to make sure that we're ready to deal with the problem whenever we face with it. So I'm just going to say, let's just find a way to get more. Um, the example that the chief gave down on the end about the barber school, 1,000 versus 600, wow. So, you know, and we know, and I'm telling you, they already do a wonderful job with our training. But if we can find a way to add more, let's add it. But if not, let's make sure that we make room or move some things around to make sure we're ready to be proactive with the problems that we may face sooner more than later. Um, I'd like to point out that approximately 75 to 80 percent of the law enforcement agencies in the state of North Carolina and across the United States have 25 full-time employees or less. And that puts a real uh, burden on an agency when it's trying to get its people trained. Um, last summer, I went through a period in Davidson where four of my officers were on light duty. It took us down from 18 to 14. And then I had to take two officers off the road and put them on a, a homicide investigation full time to get it closed. And in the meantime, the CIT training kept calling me and saying, when are you going to send somebody for 40 hours? For the legislators in the room, you may not understand that, but I know every law enforcement executive gets it. So that's a real issue for, for especially your smaller agencies across the state. The other thing I'd like to remind, and this is where being older than dirt comes in. Um, I remember when the push went across the United States to close mental health facilities. And it had to do with the constitutional right not to be held against your will on something that's not a criminal matter. And so today, again, all law enforcement knows how difficult an involuntary commitment is to get and then to keep uh, for any length of time. And what has happened in the United States is we, we do allow people to be publicly crazy. But when it creates quality of life issues or even safety issues for our communities, Chief Sweetum is correct. What, what happens is 911 gets dialed and we get called and we're the ones that are now facing, along with your sheriffs, the, the issues with mental health. Um, we have some people who are very, very good um, with dealing with uh, mental health uh, issues and, and instances. And there are actually examples where people who are in need and who are having mental health issues know to say to 911, will you send me somebody who's CIT trained? That's actually happening across, not just the state, but across the United States. So the training is really critical. Um, but we are juggling the constitutional rights along with um, the limitations that law enforcement can bring to the table when we're faced with those instances. Thank you very much. Our next question is, we have local law enforcement agencies with hundreds of officers in large urban areas. We have those in rural areas with just a handful of officers. We have agencies in very diverse communities and those in very demographically homogenous communities. Given that, do not national standards like Calia, is it Calia? or even state policy standards inevitably run into limitations on their effectiveness because of the different needs of local law enforcement? If so, how do we address that? I'll repeat it if you... Could you say that again? Sure. <laughs> we, have, 
We have local law enforcement agencies with hundreds of officers in large urban areas. We have those in rural areas with just a handful of officers, which is, you alluded to just a little earlier. We have agencies in very diverse communities and those in very demographically homogenous communities. Given that, do not national standards like CALEA or even state policy standards inevitably run into limitations on their effectiveness because of the different needs of local law enforcement? If so, how do we address that? And we're talking about size, resources, training. So, <clears throat> there's incredible value in a program like Calia accreditation. Um, so, Garner Police Department has been accredited since 1994. Uh, we get reaccredited every three years right now. I believe we're moving to a four year cycle. But for those of you not familiar, that means that we need in excess of 460 different law enforcement standards. Um, it's an incredible measure. Um, it is difficult to maintain, it is expensive to maintain, it is time consuming to maintain. Um, I have a half-time person that could probably be a full-time person, that's what they do, period. And that's in addition to spending thousands of dollars a year to maintain that accreditation. Um, so that's a burden on an agency like Garner that has 65 sworn officers it's a, um, almost impossible burden sometimes on the smaller agencies that are much more common in a state like North Carolina. 400 law enforcement agencies um, plus 100 sheriff's offices, and you know the majority of those are again under 20 officers. So the question comes, who's going to do that? Because part of CALEA is just about doing the right thing, but part of CALEA is about proving that you're doing the right thing. Um, so I commend the lead for the approach that they're taking. Um, I know that Tom mentioned that that's not an accreditation, and I understand that it's not, but it's a step in the right direction in terms of giving perhaps smaller agencies a little bit of support. Um, and I think that that's something that we as a state uh, need to look at is continuing to provide that type of support to states. One of the things that the Chiefs Association is currently working on uh, is a potential partnership with the UNC School of Government. Um, we, we have had some conversations with them about providing a staff person that would be a resource to law enforcement agencies in the context of setting policy and looking at training. Uh, the Chiefs Association is interested in becoming more involved with that. Um, I would be shocked if the Sheriff's Association wasn't involved already and, and more involved, interested in providing that service to their membership. So there is uh, there's definitely a place for that. Um, we have to find a way to make it affordable and reasonable um, to all law enforcement agencies. I want to piggyback on what Chief just said. Um, my, the whole county sheriff office is also nationally accredited. And what made us do that, I actually came from a national accredited organization, which was a federal police department. But like he said, having those, those, those policies in place, they are not only on paper, but they're tried. We have to go for reaccreditation every three years. It costs a lot. It's a lot of burden. I have a full-time accreditation manager. And trust me, every day, all day long, that's what she does. But the one thing that comes out of this is that those policies ensure that we are doing everything right all the time. I remember growing up in my community with, as a young boy with the sheriff office. Back then, they didn't have, really have policies and everybody was doing what they wanted to do the way they thought they needed to do it. But this does not, with Khalil, it makes sure that that doesn't happen. The North Carolina sheriffs always train. We train all the time and we all have been working on other measures to ensure that we have something similar to Khalil, but not Khalil, but it's pretty much the same type of thing. And again, I want to commend the lead for what they're doing. But anytime you have some type of system that deals with your policies, it's one thing to write them and put them on paper. But if you're not executing them and somebody's not checking behind you, then that could be just something to get by with. And so I, I it's, it's probably one of the best, some of the best money my county commissioners have ever spent on my county when it comes down to national accreditation. But I know everybody can't do it. So when you see the league and you see the Sheriff Association doing things and putting things in place to, to in addition, at least sure, ensure that you're doing the right thing, the sheriffs are doing the right thing, then you, you really got a plus. So that's what I want to say about accreditation since he brought it up. And again, you have rural, you have rural areas, you have some areas that are not. One thing that Khalil does, they base it on size. So 
Common County, for example, is right next door to me. Federal Police Department is right there. They're nationally accredited. But they're based on the size of your agency. The cost is also the same, based on, not the same, but based on the size of your agency. And those policies come when they have some policies that I don't have, based on the size of that county or the city of Philly. I do not have a accreditation manager. Um, uh, we have a team. And uh, it, it is difficult, but it is possible. Um, the, the Commission on Accreditation has, as the sheriff said, broken the agencies down um, into four different sizes. So you have um, the small size agency is less than 25 full-time employees, and then Garner would be what they call a B-size agency, which is 25 to 74. And then you have 75 to 300, and then plus 300 plus. And those 484 standards are applicable only if your agency actually does it. So for example, there's a whole chapter on jail standards, but the Davidson Police Department does not have a jail, so we don't have to worry about that chapter. Um, really what you're talking about is best practice. And I just I, I would like to reiterate that over and over and over again. What, what the commission is talking about is they have taken law enforcement subject matter experts and identify what is best practice. You saw um, Tom Anderson's list from the, the league, and think about that, item after item after item after item. And policy needs to be living. It needs to be something that's practiced, but it also needs to be continually reviewed and updated. Um, and, and even this morning, Tom's and my conversation about high-speed pursuit and stop sticks, and it was like a dumb moment. Oh, we need to add that to the risk assessment. But, but that's the, the commission is about professionalism, and it's a voluntary um, opportunity. I will also tell you that being the, the test site for the risk assessment at Davidson, it was easier, I think, for us to achieve and pass the LEAGUE's risk, risk assessment because we are an accredited agency. But let me share with you that we had to raise some of our training standards, especially in the area of use of force, because the chief's committee decided that they, they thought the thing that use of force and certain levels of use of force needed to be trained annually. And the commission on accreditation doesn't demand that. They demand it either by any, some, some things are annual, but other things are either biennial or triennial. So the risk assessment has actually made us even um, better, I think, and working to a higher standard. Thank you. Um, and what I'm hearing is that we've, we've got to work together to provide resources and services to the smaller communities that do not have the, the, the size and the money available for those training and accreditation. But we as a league provide those services and we want to make sure that everybody understands that they're there for that purpose and can give you some sort of a benchmark for you to, to, to pursue. Let's talk about money. Is money not a huge impediment, particularly to the small departments, to update standards and training? Also, I understand that some agencies are using seized asset money to do some training. Does that in itself create problems? Who wants to take that one off? If I understand the question correct, you're asking does seize monies, does to use it for training, does that create a problem? Well, we know that communities have limited resources and money, money is always an issue. Does that cause an impediment to the point where using asset, seized asset money to do training in itself create problems. You're scrambling for money, you're using asset money to do training. Does that create a problem in itself within the department? Well, I'll tell you, I don't think we would have survived if we hadn't been able to use those funds. I want to first say that our whole county commissioners, and even our representative, Garland Pierce, that's my representative, they have found ways to absolutely support us to the fullest. They can't always give us what we need, what we want, but but when we use the asset forfeiture funds, 
there's a guideline that you must follow. You can't just speak on anything or any type of way. Training has been one thing that we have been allowed to use. Even with the body cams, we, we started using body cameras at our agency a few years ago, even before first. And right now, every single officer, the whole kind of sheriff officer, office has also been equipped with a body camera, including my school resource officers, and also the training that goes along with that from asset forfeiture funds. Completely. Yes, sir. And we and we always we have a consultant that we talk with to make sure that we're following the following the guidelines. We bought technology for the whole county sheriff office uh, using the asset forfeiture funds, vehicles, asset forfeiture funds. But the commissioners have made a strenuous effort to make sure that we get as much as they can give us. But the offset has come from the asset forfeiture funds, and it has not created a problem for me. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm glad that we've been able to do that. And the restraints that has been put on those funds over the past years by, by Washington. That's the conversation I have had with my Congress and Senators up in Washington to release those restraints because of the effects that, they, that the monies have had for us over the 14 years I have been sure. So it has been an absolute uh, blessing for the whole kind of sure folks. That's what I want to say Thank today. You, sure. okay. So I would agree that the asset funds are, are necessary in many cases. I think the challenge that comes from that is with the diversity of the agencies we're talking about and, again, the, the potential negative impact on smaller agencies that don't have the capacity to have asset funds, um, depending on the nature of the work they do and the resources they have to do that. Um, we need to be careful in the context of relying on asset funds uh, because that can also lead into the question of how do you gather those asset funds. And when you begin to say, well, we need to have X amount this year to maintain that training budget, um, then you start to get questions, perhaps in a worst case scenario, about the work that you're doing or the enforcement you're doing to get those funds in. Um, so that is a challenge in and of itself. The, the flip side of that is if you don't have the asset funds, you run into a situation where you're then debating um, right versus right. Do I pay for uh, training this year? Do I pay for salary increases? Do I pay for equipment that we need? What do you not pay for? Um, and that becomes a problem that as we see additional mandates and voluntary requests for training, there needs to be funding that comes with that. Um, and that is more of a piecemeal approach in some communities depending on the size of the organization, um, the health of the community from an economic and fiscal standpoint, and what can they afford and do we run into situations where communities uh, aren't doing what they necessarily should be doing in training simply because they can't afford to? And that is problematic. And that's the point of the question is leading into communities that don't have these asset forfeiture funds and their ability to conduct the training and the funds that they need to conduct this extra training is, as Sheriff Peterkin just alluded to, they do the complete training, the body cameras, everything's paid for by their funds, whereas maybe in your community, you don't have those funds. You you need those dollars. You need dollars to be able to provide the training to your, to your officers that, that's needed, but you have to find different resources for it. Does anyone want to add to that? Uh, one of the things that the community college system allows is for agencies to come and train. Um, we are one of the few states that allows, as a community college system, for public safety personnel to receive training at no cost. Uh, that is what we call a feed wave training program. Uh, law enforcement, firefighters, uh, volunteer EMS, um, they get to come and train the community college system at no cost. However, that being said, it, always, it also goes back to the areas that have large community colleges versus small community colleges, and it also goes back to funding at that point. Do they have funding to allow someone from out of the state to come in and talk in a specific topic that's hot? in the country right now. If not, then they'll lose out on that training as opposed to someone that may be in a more urban area such as Mecklenburg County or Wake County or Fort Top County. Uh, the Justice Academy also uh, provides free, free training as well. Uh, the limitation with that is everyone has to travel to one of the two campuses, so therefore it takes personnel away from those areas and goes back to the same uh, issues that the panel has already done talked about uh, as far as resources. But there are resources available. Uh, there are resources, but they are limited. Mm -hmm. We've all seen the news reports and read about these tragic encounters between law enforcement and the public. 
From a policy perspective, by that I mean what can actually be changed with public policy? Are focusing on training, standards, and agency policies the most effective means of curbing these situations? And are there dangers in putting too much focus in that area? And I can repeat that. We have all seen the news reports and read about these tragic encounters between law enforcement and the public. From a policy perspective, by that I mean what can actually be changed with public policy that are focusing on training, standards, and agency policies, the most effective means of curbing these situations. Is that the only way that we can curb these situations? Or are there dangers in putting too much focus on these areas? Ferguson and Michael Brown shooting. Um, one of the things that come out of the that came out of the DOJ report on that shooting was that Ferguson, and not just Ferguson, but the entire St. Louis region uh, depended on traffic enforcement for revenue. And so you had police officers that were being pushed to do more traffic enforcement to create revenue. Um, I think when we look at what we're doing and how we're doing it, we, we need to look at those consequences. Um, I, I recently had a conversation with someone. We have, you know, and most states have these laws about um, equipment on vehicles. And vehicles, you know, your, your average, you know, personal vehicle has to be tested once a year to be able to get your registration, uh, has to pass certain tests. Um, and if we don't, you know, if, if, if your vehicle doesn't pass those tests, and it's, it's a, it is a public safety issue, then you don't get the car registered. If you don't get the car registered, then if we come across that car being drive driven and it's not registered, um, we can stop, we can cite, we can do all sorts of things. But what happens if the person that's driving that vehicle is a single mother who has a couple of kids and she's working maybe one or one and a half or two jobs, and then what happens to her and to her family as we work out, if she tries to work out the issues from the, the, the ticket? Um, what happens if she's a woman of color? What happens to her then and to her children and, and, and how do we work that out? And what if the person that stops her is a, a white officer? Um, what does that look like? What does that mean? Uh, I, I don't have any answers. I'm just raising it as an issue because I thought a lot about the Ferguson report and the fact that what happened was communities decided that they would use tra traffic ticket revenue to keep themselves afloat. But it created this tremendous um, disparity and, and a tremendous dislike between the police department and the communities they were serving. Um, and, and that only came out after you started to pull all of these apart. And it doesn't make a difference in, in the St. Louis area, whether you're talking about a predominantly white community or a predominantly black community. That's the way they were funding. So it, it's, it is an issue that I think that we need to talk about when we start talking about public policy. We need to be looking at consequences. And, and our, you know, I know that we have intended consequences, but we need to be looking at what are the unintended consequences and what does that mean for us, um, and especially if, it, if we're talking about the criminal justice system and your law enforcement agency. Sure, Peter. Well, my, and she's absolutely correct. Um, when I think about the things that's happening around the world, um, and I'm nationally accredited, but I, I have to keep it real. You, you can have all the policies and procedures in the world, but everything starts at the top. If you as a leader do not instill in your people and communicate to them that you are not going to allow 
or tolerate certain things from them, then you're subject to have any type of problem. We are nationally accredited. We have all kinds of policies. But my staff knows, I told them when I came in 14 years ago, there's a zero tolerance for uh, sexual harassment and a zero tolerance for racial uh, discrimination. And I've had to deal with it all across the board. There, and so right now, with us, it's all about accountability. I want to hold my officers accountable, and I want to hold the community accountable when they're not in line. But the policies are fine. Every once in a while, you just got to get in front of your folk, and you got to talk to them and let them know what they're doing and not doing, what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. You got to communicate that with them. I think the leader, if, if they see, and I've been in this thing almost 30 years, and I work for all types of leaders, if you as a leader does not set the example that you are going to be kind or you're going to follow the rules and regulations and the policies and procedures, if you don't set that example, then your deputies are not going to do it or police officers are not going to do it in the field. We also set the example in our community to be involved with our community. Policies and procedures are good. But they need to know that they can trust the leadership in the organizations within their community. They need to know their chiefs. They need to know their shirts. So one thing about shirts, and I've been a police officer. I've been a police, I was a police officer longer than I was a sheriff. But one thing I learned about being a sheriff, we're not hired by city council or anything like that. No, no offense now. We can't keep a job. Listen to me. We can't keep a job if we are not good. If we don't set the example, if we are not kind, if our officers are not reflecting the shirt, we get fired during the election. So, so I found out being a sheriff, being more community, being more involved with the people, letting them know the sheriff, knowing me, knowing what I am, who I am, and my officers are reflecting that, is how I keep my job. So when it comes down to policies and procedures, those are number one. We got three books that big. But I'm telling you, you as a leader, it starts at the top. You have to make sure that you're making sure that your people are doing absolutely what they're supposed to do. I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes we just have training on policies. What am I saying? We give them the policy book. They got it when they get hired. But sometimes we have training. We make them go through every single page, every single section over the policies all over again, make them sign, making sure they understand it. And then me as the sheriff, I'm sitting in there and I get in their face and say, make sure if you're doing this, I'm not going to tolerate that. And I've had, and I'm going to say this to up, I've had officers, I've had white officers who were discriminative. I fired Zero tolerance. I've had blacks that did it. Zero tolerance. I don't care what your rank is, you can be a captain, you can be a major, I don't care what it is. I may know your dad and your mom. But if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, and that comes from the top. That comes from the top. It's not political. It comes from the top. That's how you make sure that it gets done in addition to the policies and procedures that you have in your office. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. So, if I could, um, to, to the question of is there danger in putting too much focus on the issues related to training, um, again, I would commend the, the Legislative Black Caucus and the League for this discussion because I believe it is critical to recognize that although clearly law enforcement is a component of what is going on, this is not a law enforcement only issue. This is a societal and community issue that needs to be discussed in forums like this and with other people. Um, part of that absolutely falls on us. We need to do a better job of educating the community that we serve, um, not just in terms of what we do, but why we do it. Um, and not from the standpoint of expecting a group hug afterwards, but because they deserve to know why we do that. They may disagree, but they at least deserve to know why do we do that. And if we are more effective at that, we're going to be more transparent. We're going to build the trust that needs to be built within our communities. And with that, when that default in a community is trust, you don't end up with situations typically like we see in some of the communities around the country um, where the default is to riot or the default is to do other things without having information and knowledge. Um, we have to build that trust back or continue to build on what we have with our communities. Um, we need to have that discussion and we need to help people understand again, how they should behave when they encounter the police. We need to behave the right way, 
but we also need to help citizens understand how to behave and how to interact with law enforcement to avoid some of these difficulties. Um, and we could we could talk for probably all on that. I think that's important. Thank you, Chief. Jonathan. Oh, that's questions. Thank you. Lately, within some agencies, there's been some focus on de-escalation training. Proponents say that this is a step that should have been taken a long time ago. Critics suggest that it could put officers more at risk. How do you see de-escalation training? I'll start at the end. Okay. Within the ability program, uh, we do have a small block. Uh, it's called communications. In communications, there is a component that deals with de-escalation and how to train new officers on how to approach someone during an encounter. There are some practical exercises with that block of instruction. The only drawback is it's only eight hours. We go back to our previous discussion on how many hours are in the program, 616 hours. Where do we go, add the hours, take hours away so we can focus on some of these other issues related to adding in scenario-based training. I've got an eight-hour block. I have 20 students to get through that hour, eight-hour block with a few exercises. Then we move on to the next topic. Again, where do we find the time to give these students the, the training they need? Thank you. Chief? So I agree that de-escalation is absolutely a critical component of what we do. It's important to train on that. Uh, again, my former chief taught me that you know if it's important, you don't train on it one time. You train on it over and over and over again. You build that muscle memory, um, and that's what we need to do uh, in that area with all of our folks is continue to remind them that that is an option. But I agree that there is some potential danger in that as well, and that we need to remember that we are asking young men and women, sometimes 21, 22 year olds with maybe no life experience. Um, that have completed 616 hours of training, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're potentially alone on a traffic stop, and someone steps out that may or may not have a gun. And we ask them in a millisecond to make a decision. So I absolutely support the concept of de-escalation, but we need to do it intelligently to make sure that we don't put police officers in a situation where they pause or don't react like they should. Um, it, it's a horrible catch-22 in terms of what we're asking, particularly these young men and women, you know, I think it's important to remember that, you know, we all sound at least hopefully semi-intelligent, um, but we've done this for a really long time, and none of us are likely to show up at 2 o'clock in the morning when somebody calls for that domestic or makes that traffic stop. You're getting a 21, 22, 23-year-old that's going to do the absolute best they can, and I believe that in my heart. I think the incidents that we're looking at are isolated incidents, and within those isolated incidents, if you're looking at even a smaller, tiny group of police officers wanting to do wrong. Um, we're people, we make mistakes, but that's, we need to, and I know that can sound uh, defensive or sound like we're trying to make excuses, but it's just reality. And so we need to start use that as somewhat of a starting point for the conversation about who are these police officers and what are they trying to do and how are they trying to do it. Um, so the de-escalation is important. Uh, one of the things that we have been trying to focus on also is implicit bias training. Um, again, I don't believe that we have police officers running around that are racist, that are inherently wrong, um, but we all have implicit biases that if we're not aware of them, they influence how we act and decisions we make. So that's an important component of it. Um, we need to continue to train on use of force in other areas. Um, so there, there's a lot to be done there. Thank you. I'd like to add one thing to what Chief said. The group of students that we see coming through the ability now, 19, 20, 21 year olds, one of the things that we're seeing overall, and I've talked to other school directors about this, we see individuals in that age group that do not know how to communicate on a one on one conversation level that we are doing now. Um, our generation, I could go to the grocery store just to pick up a gallon of milk. I'll be going an hour. Well, I'll, I'll see people. I talk. How you doing? What's going on? Just to actually get to know them, what's going on, put a little value back into them. Today's generation, I've got a text I can get a gallon of milk. Can you pick it up on the way home? So that's one of the things that we're seeing, and, and that's the hurdle that we're trying to overcome within the training is how do we get these young kids to actually use their mouth and their brains to communicate 
clear instructions on what they want, what they want from you, and then reiterate that to come back. Uh, that's one of the challenges that we're seeing on the training side right now. Thank you. Sure. Like I, said, I totally agree with everything that's been said. I, when I think about the explanation, I think of, this is what comes to mind, doing absolutely everything you can to calm the situation. Um, you know, seeing some of the incidents that's happened, they may have been, um, if there was a little bit more de-escalation, some of the situations probably would have turned out the way they did. He cut me off, but anyway. <laughs> 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 that's not an invitation, I'm sorry. But, but I, I just want to see, I just want to see that officers are using everything that they possibly can not to have to do, resort to other measures. You know, as Chief was just saying, we don't want them to be scared and hesitate out there. And that's, you know, that was where I, where I went to my get my guys. I called all of my, I got about 100 sworn uh, deputies with detectives and everything. And I asked them when I called the meeting, are you afraid to do your job? Are you hesitant? Are you afraid that if you don't do this or do that? You know, and I asked them. That's, that's one of those times you get in front of them. But I want them to exercise every measure they can, use the levels of force, you know, don't don't just you know if you can don't go don't go to the red immediately. I mean, I'm, I've had officers stop me when I'm in my travels, and when they walk up to the car, he's already mad. He's already in the red. So I think you know when we're training our officers, and like he was saying, they only get eight hours. I would like to, me, I would like to see a little more of that because I think that would contribute to some of the problems that we're facing. So they'll know that they don't have to be uh, so definitive all the time. But like as the chief said, also we don't want to overdo it. We got to make sure they know not to be hesitant. That this, when you go through traditional training for, for de-escalation, we're not telling you to stand there and let somebody shoot you or stab you or kill you. We just want you to be careful and exercise every single thing you can before you maybe have to pull that trigger or may have to do something that will lead to someone's death. So I, I think a little bit more training would be nice to be here. But it goes back to what you said earlier. Where are we going to get the time? Where are we going to? And then she said earlier as well, we may have to move some things around. We may have to find some balance to get some of the most important things that we need for the problems that we may be facing at this time. Thank you, Sheriff. Chief. In the North Carolina Criminal Justice Standards Commission mandates, um, as part of its in-service annual training, that officers qualify on their firearm. What it doesn't mandate is making is decision making. So when we're training, we put a lot of emphasis on firearm because it's it's high liability, but we don't put emphasis on decision making where we force officers into a position of choosing something else, choosing pepper spray, choosing an aspiton, choosing their taser. Um, we don't put them in that position. Our agency, um, a year ago, wanted to buy um, a couple of what they call simunition handguns. They were $800 a piece. That is a princely sum for many agencies. Um, and I've actually extended, we, we ended up being able to buy two of them. And when we've gone through our training, we are including the Davidson College Public Safety Department with us because A, they're close, um, they'll back us up if we need it. Uh, and they didn't have the money for that kind of equipment. I mean, something that simple that allows you to safely train to make a decision on what, what tool to go for. And let's get back to de-escalation. The first tool is this one. Um, I have an ongoing saying when we're recruiting people and that's that we want to be careful not to, not to hire someone, and this is, again, really old school, who starts a fight in the phone booth. If you can start a fight in the phone booth, that means you're starting a fight all by yourself in a phone booth. <laughs> Ain't nobody else there. And so it, it has to do with who are we hiring, what kind of skills do they have, what kind of skills are we giving them, and then how do we keep training? But, it takes time and money. And even though the, the and, and in Mecklenburg County, the Central Piedmont Community College also provides free training, but I still have to pay for the officer's time 
to be in that class. And if his position isn't filled, I need to pay someone overtime to fill his position. So it's free, but it's not. Thank you. This is off script, but I have a question very quickly. I've read several articles, and I'm not an expert in law enforcement training, but you talked about implicit bias. Do you believe that implicit bias can be changed? Not particularly, um, but, big but. Um, I think, because implicit bias comes from who we are, it's how we've grown up, it's our experiences, you can't change that. But what you can change is your awareness of your implicit biases and recognizing when they're influencing your decision making. Um, that's what I really took from it. Um, because I've tried to look at this uh, from a lot of different points. I've looked at the escalation training, I've looked at implicit bias training. We were fortunate to send a couple of folks to sort of train the trainer that have come back and put all of our staff through implicit bias training from me to the, to the newest officer and our civilian staff as well. Um, so I believe that we can absolutely be better if we appreciate and understand implicit bias. I don't think you can ultimately change it as who we are, but I think understanding is an important piece. Thank you. How concerned are each of you that we are in a vicious cycle now? That with public focus on what we would all agree are tragic encounters, fewer people are willing to go into this profession. And that, in, and that it becomes more difficult to hire well-qualified officers. What's the way out of that situation? How do we get out of it? Uh, first of all, we've got to get more students into the program. Uh, within the last year, there have been over 20 programs across the state uh, that have had to cancel their BOT programs because of lack of students. Um, the state requires a minimum of 10 students to be able to run a program, and when we're losing 20 schools, you do the math. Uh, with that being said, it has a ripple effect across the state. If agencies need to fill vacancies, but we have no officers to go into those vacancies, that creates more stress within the department, more stress within the personnel that work on the department. So again, it has a ripple effect. It's absolutely an issue, um, and if I had the answer to it, respectfully, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be writing a book and making a lot of money. Um, we need to expand the applicant pool. Um, because we can't, I don't believe, change our hiring practices. We can't change our standards. Um, the public doesn't want that. We don't want that. They want the white people doing this incredibly difficult job. Um, but we need to enhance our applicant pools um, so that we can then hire a good, diverse workforce that is representative of the community we serve. Um, we struggle to find minority and female candidates, um, particularly minority and female candidates that are qualified. Um, and I don't have a great answer to that. Uh, it is absolutely getting more difficult, I think, than it has been. Um, you know, I, I tell people, here's my sales pitch. Um, and we do okay in terms of, I think, salary. Um, so my sales pitch is I want to offer you maybe $38,000 a year to come and work 12-hour shifts, nights, weekends, holidays. Um, I want you to have to wear a bulletproof vest all the time because people are crazy. Um, I want you to have to sometimes go from doing nothing in a day to two seconds later be involved in a pursuit or a fight for your life. Um, and not only now, today, uh, we all know that we respectfully are the folks that run towards the danger when others run away. Um, I've said for a long time there's something not quite exactly right about anybody that will do this. But we've always understood that. And we went into that not happy about it, but you knew that. But now you also have to warn your candidates, if you're truthful, um, that not only do you have to be concerned about potentially giving your life to protect the life of another, but you have to be careful at the gas pumps because there's people sniping and murdering police officers. Part of my friends, who the hell is going to do that? It's an incredibly difficult task to ask someone to do. We have a long way to go in terms of selling this profession. Now, there's a lot to be sold. Um, I try to talk about make a difference days um, with our folks because I believe not every day, but a lot of days you can go home knowing that you made a difference for someone. Um, maybe it's a fellow officer, maybe it's someone in the community. Um, so there are make a difference days. We need to highlight those, we need to sell the positive, um, we need to do a better job of uh, interacting with the community and seeking that support. 
Um, I think over the past two months, um, I can't tell you the number of meals that have been delivered and cookies that have been delivered and snacks that have been delivered. Um, so the community, the majority of the community does support us, um, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily willing to do what we're asking these young men and women to do. And I don't know, I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm not sure what the answer is. Thank you. Sure. I just want to add, just quickly, you know, it's not only becoming a problem to recruit, but it's also become a problem to retain these people. You know, when you got officers in your agency who are lieutenants or captains um, quitting, they're going to take a job somewhere else. And then also we got to think about the effect on their families. Until this stuff calms down, until we come up with a solution to, to let people know, I mean, we're talking about North Carolina right now, so this is what we're focusing on. And it's, this is, again, I want to iterate, reiterate what he said. This is a good thing today. I want to commend you for putting this together. But we right now have an opportunity to be proactive, to calm it down, and to reassure the state of North Carolina that this is okay for them to be in law enforcement, to stay in law enforcement. And then when you look at this, I'm just going to put a make a plan. $38,000 for your life out here now, to, to be standing up there, taking a sniper shot, and all that. No way. When you go to Walmart distribution and, and get a decent job over there paying you more. Or go to Verizon over there and sell phones and make $75,000 a year. So these guys are quitting. These men and women are quitting this stuff. But I will say the advantage that we have is most people that get in this business today, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, are people who really want to be in law enforcement. They, they got a passion for this. Ever since they was children, they want to be in this business. So I think what we're doing today, and I'm hoping that we, whatever we decide or whatever we move forward from here today, we educate the public that we are doing something about it, that we're going to, we're making a difference. So that if the word to get out that, hey, you know, the sheriffs and the chiefs and the legal municipality and the black caucus legislators are going to make sure that we have everything in place, best practices in place, to, to make sure that we're doing what we need to do and keep attracting those people that want to be in this business regardless of what the pay is. Chief um, Miller? This is an honorable profession. This is an honorable profession. I got involved in law enforcement um, because I grew up in the 60s and the early 70s when I was watching on the 6 o'clock news, um, one of only three television stations in the world. What was going on with the civil rights protests and how civil rights protesters were being treated and what was happening with the Vietnam War protests. And after I went away to college after my first year, my father um, said something a little bit like uh, Chief Brown said in Dallas. If you really want to make a difference, get inside. Get inside and do something. Now, he didn't know what inside meant. And if he had known that inside for me meant getting with the Detroit Police Department, I think he would have never said that. <clears throat> and here's an interesting fact. You know, I, so I got involved in, I, I got sworn into the Detroit Police Department on October 8th, 1973. I remember it. It was a, a watershed moment for me. And I spent 18 really good years there doing everything I could for the people of the city of Detroit and for the Detroit Police Department and being the best I could possibly be. When I came to Davidson um, my very first night, someone came up to me and said, you know a relative of mine and you worked with him in Detroit. This gentleman's name was Clinton Donaldson. Clinton Donaldson grew up in Davidson. Clinton Donaldson had mustered out of the Army in the mid to late 60s and after the 67 riots in Detroit, um, his preacher came to him and said, we're recruiting young black men for the Detroit Police Department. Will you join? And Clinton did. Clinton has his PhD. He's teaching in Florida. He did a complete career um, in the, with the Detroit Police Department. I worked with Clinton at the gang squad, and I worked for him at the internal affairs section. Um, and he came to Davidson recently to visit me. This is an honorable profession. We have bad doctors. We have bad lawyers. 
get bad politicians. We can be better. Um, and, and I would like to see more of this kind of conversation. Does it mean that there are fewer of us in the room and that we're able to maybe tackle even more difficult questions and more difficult situations if there are fewer of us and we're sitting across the table from each other. I think that is an important part of all of this, that we have to be speaking, we have to be communicating, we have to be talking to each other face to face, and not from dais to audience, but across a cup of coffee, across lunch, um, and and really, and we need to, the police officers need to do that in their communities. We need to do it at this level as well. Thank you, Chief Miller. And this is the final question, and then we'll open it up for some questions. It's been touched down a few times today. Uh, let's talk more about issues outside of training. Standards, you know, training standards and accreditation that can help strengthen the trust between law enforcement and communities that they serve. Whether community policing, community meetings, or other means of more proactive engagement with the public, what have you been doing and what else can we do outside of the training areas that we've discussed today? Well, I would tell you, and I think particularly for our legislators, and, and many of you know this, but to remind you that we are not reactive, we are not waiting on this. As a matter of fact, over a year ago, in April of 2015, the Chiefs Association hosted a forum um, in Raleigh at the League. Um, and we talked about a variety of issues. We talked about the challenges facing police. And training was a part of that conversation, but it was a part of that conversation. So out of that, we came out with uh, three focus areas that we continue to emphasize today. Um, that again, we've had good luck in working collaboratively with, with Mark and his staff at the Justice Academy. The first one that we came out with was community relations is an ongoing philosophy that permeates attitude, policies, and operations throughout a police force. The second was non-biased policing as a fundamental principle excuse me, that must be continuously reinforced. And the third was training concerning use of force must be comprehensively reviewed and revised. So I think a lot of that is what we talked about today. Uh, community policing is, is sort of in some cases it's a catchphrase, but in some places it's exactly what we need to do. And it's just that simple, it's interact with your community. Uh, whether you're doing that through uh, coffee with a cop, or doing that through uh, a police athletic activities league, or just in holding community forums, um, but there's a lot that we can do, again, to share our message. And our message needs to be honest. Our message needs to be that there are areas that we can do better. Um, because A, we're people, and people make mistakes. Um, and there's areas that we can continue to be more consistent, but there's also a lot of good that goes on in the law enforcement profession. And there's a lot of positive interactions with the community. There are those make a difference days. So I think that if we continue to look at, at that sort of thing, um, we can be effective. Thank you. Sheriff? Sure. You pretty much said what I was going to say. You know, and that's one thing that we focus on in, in our county is being involved with our community every every chance we get. I mean, my staff used to com always complain about why are we having this pub this community event? Why are we doing this? Why do we adopt kids at Christmas? Why do we have things for the senior citizens? Why do we sponsor National Night Out? We just had National Night Out the other week. We had a little less than 2,000 people at that park. We fed them all. We gave them drinks. We had all kind of things. And it gives people, we had people speaking on the stage. We had bands. So we do those things to, keep, to have a relationship with them. It's not a day where somebody's going to jail. You know, you, you just build a relationship. Like you said, I like the term that you just you make a difference day. I like that. That's a very good one. And so anytime we can get outside of the, the norm of just going out there and putting handcuffs on, same way, that, same way in our schools. We want to let the kids know we're not there to take them to jail. We're there to be a, a bridge between all of that to prevent them from going in that direction. So, Anything you can do outside of that, I think that's a plus uh, when you can do it. You know, he said community police, and that's a word I've heard for years. Uh, to me, it might be, it sounds good, but it can be a little bit outdated if you're not doing anything. If you're just saying the word and not really putting it to work. So that's what it's all boiled down to, just what he just said. Thank you, Sheriff. Chief Miller? 
I think that where we can, we need to get out of the cruisers um, or squad car. I don't know what's called a squad car. We need to get out of the car. Um, you heard in my introduction, our officers are expected to do at least two hours of foot patrol. Um, when we talk about policies and procedures, it's one thing to have them in writing. It's another thing to know that they're actually being acted on. I was at a uh, church meeting with a, a group of elders um, recently and was explaining how we expect our officers to do foot patrol um, and what is expected of them. And this woman looked at me all of a sudden and said, well, I just want you to know it's working. She said um, it was the summer and she had had her windows open, it wasn't stifling. And she heard two voices, and she lives in um, our predominantly black neighborhood. And she looked out her window thinking, you know, what's going on? And when she looked out her window, here come two of my officers walking down the street, and they were quietly talking to one another, but they were on foot patrol. We have um, a commitment to all of our community that they live, that they have peace and tranquility. Um, Davidson has this saying that every place should be like Davidson. <laughs> <laughs> Davidson guys. <laughs> um, but every place should be like Davidson. And that's not a joke. Every place should be. We shouldn't have the kind of shootings and crime rate that we've got. And, and officers need to commit. To, to seeing to it that neighborhoods, we have one apartment that's a, an affordable apartment building, and I have an officer that is just all over those residents. They, they call them now, and if there's a problem, he takes care of it. They want peace and tranquility, and to be able to live and raise their kids in a crime-free situation. Who doesn't want that? But we have to make a commitment to that, too, um, and, and honor our citizens and, and be the servants, be, be the, the guardians that we need to be, um, and, and show them that. So. Thank you, Chief. Jonathan? I look at things from a, from a trainer's perspective uh, pretty much all the time. Um, we review videos, we talk to instructors, we talk to students, and we're constantly evaluating. If we can get young officers, seasoned officers, to actually become more interactive with the community, like my counterparts have said, I think that's the key. The only way you can establish trust is you've got to get out and talk to the people in the community. That's the only way you're going to be able to do it. You can't do it by sitting in the cruiser just driving by, okay, that's, okay, waving at them. You've got to get out and communicate with them, kind like we used to. Thank you. And now I'll open up the floor. We have uh, just several minutes for some questions. Um, and I think that we might have some. Sarah, we have several out here that with microphones. First question. Sure. Um, Senator Foley, because I represent Durham and Granville County. So I want to first thank the League for pulling this together, and the Legislative Black Caucus, and for all of you who participated as a part of this panel. It's been very interesting and very insightful, so I appreciate the perspectives which you share. But the thing I was interested in knowing is this I, I heard a discussion uh, about uh, de escalation training, which I think is critically important, understanding implicit bias a lot of reading and research in that area. And, and the thing that I'm trying to look at somewhat more holistically, in addition to the training which law enforcement can provide, and I think that's a critical component, so that they interact with the community more and are more engaged in terms of getting out of their cruisers. I know we did that a lot in, in Durham back when I was a city council years ago. Uh, but, but to the extent to which you could become more engaged in getting the community to understand and getting involved perhaps in our public education system. So the kids coming along when they're going through school, those perhaps going through driver's training, those that are really uh, not yet really had their first contact sometimes. 
move law enforcement to their community and to set for casual contact to understand what appropriate conduct might be if they're pulled over by an officer, how perhaps you can enlighten people as to conduct that an officer might feel is inappropriate or in fact beginning to incite an officer that they could perhaps become more engaged in because I think that's part of the equation as well. How do we get kids to understand growing up? How do we get adults to understand that are already out there in the community that is kind of a, a two-way street? But we've got to get the officers as engaged as possible, as well trained as possible, but understanding that if they do get pulled over and that blue light's on, maybe the first reaction shouldn't be to get out of the car to start walking toward the officer or engaging in conduct that might suggest that they are, are going for a weapon or engaging in conduct that an officer might view as being threatening, but which perhaps is completely, totally innocent conduct that they feel as a citizen is the right thing to do. So how do we get engaged with that two-way street to get citizens enlightened and at the same time work on getting law enforcement as engaged as we can in terms of viewing this problem holistically? And perhaps some of that's being done that I'm not aware of. I know I did speak with a retired officer about a Mecklenburg County who had some really fascinating ideas about how we could go about doing this. But since you guys are engaged each and every day, perhaps it's something that you've given thought to that you could uh, provide some insights. Because I think that it has to be a two-way street and we've got to work on it from both perspectives. And there's probably other perspectives out there that I haven't even thought about. But uh, if you could each provide some thoughts on this. I just want to say, first of all, that is an awesome question. Um, awesome. And you are absolutely correct. You know, as we train our officers within the agencies, we also have to educate our communities. I mean, that's something that the Sheriff's Association has been good. When we had the church thing going on, we came up with training on how to train the churches on how to be safe and all this type of stuff. But also, with the problems with the, the average child out there now, 16, 17-year-old driver, is scared. You talk to some of the young people in the school, they'll say, I'm afraid the police stop me. Particularly the black kids, I'm just going to be black. Okay? So how do we help? We, we should get in front of these people. So, like, just for example, in our county, we just started, we went to the driver's education, we hit right on it. We asked them, because they teach this in, in, in their classes, about what to do when they stop by a cop. But they haven't heard it from us. So we, we got our school resource officers involved. They are now going into the driver's education training. These new people who are going to start getting on the street, start driving, who hear all this stuff, to see all this stuff on TV, to read all this stuff in the paper, who think when they see a blue light, they're going to have to start screaming and, or confront the police because they think we're the enemy. So now the officer is going to go in and say, this is what we expect from you when we get ready to pull you over. And allow them to ask questions about or, or get, get through those fears of what they heard and what they think is going to happen when they get stopped by a cop. Um, and then also, we're, we're getting ready to set up something for the community. My captain was talking to me about it coming, coming up here this morning. He said, sure, we should, can we do a, a countywide um, workshop to talk to the public on what we expect from them when we, we stop them? Also talking about the levels of force. She spoke about the first thing is that you're going to get from an officer when you confront it is verbal. He's going to give you some type of commands of what you should do, uh, put your hands behind your back or whatever it may be. And then he's going to walk you through, we're going to walk him through the different levels of force all the way to Delhi and how it can go from one extreme to the next. Because we hear the question from people who say, well, why did you shoot him? Why didn't you use the baton? Well, they don't understand that you can't use the baton if the guy got a gun in his hand. That's not, the, that's, that's not a level of force that you want to use at that time. You need to skip that level and go to the next. So to answer your question, we need to find time. No, not find time. Make time to get in front of our community and help them to understand these things. So, and, but if we leave it out there and we don't do it, when it happens, not if, when it happens, 
they're going to second guess us, and you're going to have the problems that you see across the, this, the United States. Thank you, Sheriff. To keep time moving, I'll go to the next question and have another. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what as we as legislators, from your perspective, can do in terms of public policy to make your decision making and your management roles easier in law enforcement, be it in mental health, uh, recruitment and training of officers, uh, just training in general, in any area that you desire to speak to to address that? Chief Zuto? I guess the easy answer is money, um, to just be blunt, but, but I, I say that semi-kiddingly, I think there's a number of things that you can do. I think one is to continue to attend events like this and to get educated about what is going on. Um, a quick answer to your question, sir, is that if you're not sure what's going on, then we fail because we're doing a lot of stuff. But if you're not aware of it, then we're not doing our job to share that. Um, so in terms of the legislature, I think we need to keep a good dialogue going. Um, I encourage you to do what you have, I think, always done, and particularly of late, perhaps with us, and, and for a longer time with the Sheriff's Association, is talk to us and listen to at least have our perspective. It's not the only perspective, but it is a perspective on what's going on in law enforcement and related to training and other things like that. And then do what you've also done, which is lend that financial support when appropriate to what you think is important. And ideally, we can collaborate and agree as to what may be important and recognize that doing more sometimes costs more. You don't do more with less, you don't do more with the same, you do more with more, and that sometimes costs money. So if it's important, lend your support to that. Um, you've shown the willingness to do that recently. We have two new positions at the Justice Academy that are going to help us implement new and better training, um, but there's a variety of other ways to do that. So I think keeping this communication open and understanding one another and helping to do collaboration in terms of prioritization is important. Sure. Just very quick to piggyback on what he said, I want to say the one thing that y'all do real well and I want it to always be there. You allow us to come see you. We walk into that general assembly, we walk into your office, y'all listen to us, you hear our cries, you hear our thoughts and concerns, and you trust, you give us that trust even when we agree to disagree. And I'm telling you, the one thing that North Carolina has is you, you allow your officers, I mean, your, your sheriffs and chiefs to have the authority to hire and fire their people, to manage their people. In those states where you got those, uh, uh, what is it, the unions over there, where they're telling you what you can and can't do. You know, if you got bad officers and you got a union in the state of North Carolina, we can't get rid of them. But as chiefs and sheriffs, we can look at these people and we can spot them coming in the door and we can get, I mean, I'll be honest, the control, and I know we've had to deal with this so many times, but to be able to walk in there and discuss this with you. You know, God, I sit in his office, and he, he'll, he'll, he will debate, he'll talk. I like that about it. And, my, and listen, my representative comes to Hope County. We sit down and talk about it there. He calls me and check on things all the time. So to be able to, to continue being in front of you guys, y'all welcome us in. You come down, y'all know y'all get tired of us when we come in and go. But you guys let us get in front of you and you listen to us and you trust us. That's what we want more than anything, to continue that relationship that y'all have given us all these years. Thank you, Sheriff. One, one, I'm sorry, one quick follow-up. The other thing I would say is that recognize that you are dealing with 500 law enforcement agencies. Um, so the idea of one size fits all can't work, unfortunately. So we need to work collaboratively to find that happy medium that potentially works for Garner and the county and Davidson and other places. So just use caution in terms of bringing a, a solution to a, perhaps a problem that doesn't exist or perhaps a problem that only exists in an isolated place and can have negative actual impact in other places. Thank you. In the President's Task Force on 21st Century Community Policing, there was a discussion about the role of policy and the dynamic against organizational culture. I think the quote that was used is that organizational culture eats policy for lunch. And so we can have all the policies we want on the book. But I would like to know, is there a committee or do you have a task force? Are you looking at it from a training aspect, looking at your 616 hours for the BLET? Are you looking at maybe doing some revisions 
that will help us deal with the implicit biases. They're not going anywhere, we all have them, but is there some level of training that we can offer or add to the 616 hours so that all officers will meet different people with equal expectation? How do we advance that? Are we looking at improving um, or increasing the hours in de-escalation training or recertification? A lot of our um, occupations, I'm a teacher. I have to be recertified every X amount of years and I have to do ongoing training before I can reach my recertification. I know you do um, firearm recertification, but is there a commitment or is there a task force looking at how we can modify our training so that we can look at de-escalation or dealing with implicit biases so that we can treat everyone we need, regardless of color and gender, with equal expectation. Thank you. Jonathan? Within the state of North Carolina, uh, the Criminal Justice Education Training Standards Commission, along with the Sheriff's Education Training Standards Commission, have revision committees that meet on a regular basis. Uh, they're looking at BLET programs, they're looking at these service topics. Uh, they meet on a regular basis and decide what type of topics need to be discussed and developed uh, by the Justice Academy years in advance. If there are issues that come to the forefront, they will, the committees will look at that and they may put something on the back agenda to move something forward. Uh, again, that is a process, there's a formal process that's that plays from the provision committees up to the committee, up to the commissions for approval. So that's how that works, and we are doing things to, to address that. If there are things within the commission um, that need to be addressed that agencies haven't identified, the public also is invited to come to these meetings as well uh, so they can interact with, with the commissions and, and bring in their input. Thank you. That is a question. This one has a question. With the era of uh, cell phones now, uh, sheriff and Richard Catholic, there, would you be, would you also be offended? If a person would be cool with what was happening, like what happened in the incident, would your staff be offended? Would you also be offended? You know how the lady recorded the incident was happening with her. Would that offend the officer? I just just want to ask that. Yes, question. would they be offended if someone posts a camera to on a phone, a smartphone, they record them on the duty? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just I didn't know how that would work. It happens all the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't want that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to say this, you know, not only are they recording us, but we're recording them. And then I tell my staff, when you're talking and dealing with the public, you act like there's a camera on you every okay. single okay. time. Okay, that's just, yeah, that's part of life now. That's what they're doing. Somebody they recording us over here. Well, it, they can't. It, to me, this is what the world has come to now. Uh, so I'm, I'm not seeing them complain about it. This guy here been recording me ever since I've been up here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is meant more of as a public service announcement. I heard a lot uh, of talking uh, as the panel was speaking about about funding, and I just wanted to make clear to everybody in the room that we do have uh, five million dollars of funding that was allocated from the state last year for body camera uh, purchase. And what I found is that a lot of folks still aren't aware that that money is out there. And so if you are uh, a smaller police department who's interested in getting body cameras and, and anything that goes along with that body camera, including training, equipment, uh, storage, all of these fun, all these funds can be used for those purposes. So I think that's about six months ago, about three million dollars of that money had been used. So you probably have two million dollars left out there that is a matching grant uh, program that you can apply for. So please. Uh, take advantage of that money that's, uh, that's out there. And let me also say this, that was not just uh, a democratic initiative. Uh, as I said earlier, this is about working together and about doing things as one. And we had a great group of people who worked on that legislation with us and ended up getting passed in the budget. Um, uh, Representative Alexander, Representative Rodney Moore, and also uh, Representative Charlie Jeter and Representative Jason Sainz, who were co-sponsors of that uh, legislation, who worked that money in. So the only way we're going to get through this is together and uh, through a bipartisan approach and through a police and community approach. But please do look into that money. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll add um, a, a comment or a time 
to what was just said about the body cameras, which is a great initiative. But some of the struggles that, that leaders are having across the state with body cam cameras are not the issue with the purchase of body cameras, but it's the storage. And that's where the dilemma lies. I know in our community, we have no problem with body cameras or walking, but the issue is storage and the amount of costs from general fund dollars that it will take to store the data from the amount of officers that we have, the shifts that we have. So it is a continued challenge that we're all trying to deal with across the state. But, um, but it is a step forward with the initiative with, that you all have to provide those funds for that. Um, as we close, uh, can we give our panel a round of applause? For this? Thank you. Before I put my closing remarks, I've served uh, in public office now for 12 years and I've, I've grown to have such a great deal of respect for public safety officers and the job that they do each and every day. Um, it's just an incredible, I mean, imagine a job where, as someone said earlier, you know, you, you go to work and, and the eye is on you, your whole entire shift, you got body cameras, you got car cameras, everybody's looking at you and you're responsible for every minute of your day at work. I don't think many professions have that responsibility and it's, and it's, a, and it's a great deal of responsibility that we put on our public safety officers and I just want to... Uh, I want to tell you that you are appreciated. If you're in uniform, I want to thank you for your service. And I know that the citizens, the great majority of the citizens do appreciate what, you, what each and every one of you do and how you do it and the value that you put in the community. I know that's not said enough, but it needs to be said more, and I will say it here today. Uh, I congratulate you for what you do, and it is an honorable profession, and I will agree with that. We hope that this has been a productive session today, and it is obviously one that will be continuing in the future. I know that we all want the same thing, to effectively provide public safety in all of our communities and to do, some impartial, to do it in a just and impartial manner. Please know that the League of Municipalities are here as your partners. We will continue. We've heard what you've said today. We will take it back. We will analyze and look for ways to partner with you and to help provide the gaps and resources that you may need to, to do your jobs and to do it in a more effective manner. So thank you so much for being with us today and taking time out of your schedules. And we hope you have a safe ride home today. And without further ado, thank you again. Have a, have a great day.